Hello again and welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. I'm your host, Gary Peugeot, and today we're joined by Kate McQuaid, who's the Senior Director of Marketing at P360, and Kate is coming to us from Maryland. Hi, Kate. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you, Gary? I'm doing great. So can you first tell us a little bit about what the heck a P360 is? It sounds like a an exercise dieting program. <laughs> yeah, um, P360 is actually a small company. We're based in um, New Jersey, but we're global. Um, yeah. And we're a tech company, and we cater to the pharma, biotech um, space, also a little bit of healthcare, um, mm-hmm. and we create engagement software is basically what we do. So it's not like P90X or anything like that? No, no. Although they do have a better brand awareness, I think. We're, we're, we're just getting started as far as people recognizing who we are. <laughs> nice, nice. So tell me about your background. How, how much experience do you have in marketing and what is your passion? Why did you get into this? Sure. Um, So I've been in marketing uh, 19 years. Actually, this summer I'll cross over that 20-year mark. Dun, dun, dun. Um, And I've been in marketing in all kinds of capacities in my career. And I love it because it's never the same. Marketing, I always say, is a moving target. So what works today didn't work six months ago. And what works today might not work in six months from now. So I love that idea that you're constantly testing things. You're constantly thinking outside the boxes. And you can try a lot of really creative things to mm-hmm. get your brand out there and to get people to pay attention to you. So that, that excites me. Um, I'm also specifically been trained in small and medium-sized businesses. Um, I've never, for better or for worse, never worked for a giant conglomerate. Which is kind of hard to do in the healthcare field. <laughs> it, it is. It is, which is why um, even though I'm in healthcare or in that market, that industry, um, I'm, I've really just been tech-based. So I've worked yeah. for companies that are tech-focused, yeah. um, and that's really helped me to kind of grow from those small businesses um, up to those medium-sized businesses, which has been really fun. So we're not here really to talk about health, but we are here to talk about marketing. So we're going to talk a lot because that's what I want to talk to you is kind of, you know, getting sort of a tech focused market thing, because what I find in like the photo imaging space, when there is a technology involved, it seems to, they get very excited about features and, you know, this and that, and then it just misses the mark in terms of what consumers are actually, you know, responding to. What are some of the ABCs of marketing a fee, a feature upgrade, for example, and from your standpoint? Um, so I think the biggest thing to focus on when you're marketing is um, consistency. Right. I really think that you need to be out there and talking about, let's say, as your example, a feature set that's coming, um, really talking about that over and over again and having that one voice is what I I, I like to call it. So if you're a team of three people or if you're a team of 30, all of them, if they're standing in line at Starbucks and they're asked what they do, should be saying basically the same thing. They should have that same talk track. And it's not a memorization of rote thing, but they should have that same couple bullet points that they're talking about. Like, hey, my this new feature set is A, B, C, and D. Or, hey, that's really cool because we do X, Y, Z. And having that consistency in what that voice is, is huge for people people to be able to hear it. Um, they used to say that you would need seven touch points for someone to remember who you are. And that can be an ad they see, that can be somebody in the line at Starbucks, it can be you know an email they get, and at the seventh time they're like, oh, hey, I remember that company. And now with everything happening so fast with technology, they actually say that that's closer to 21 touch points. Oh, okay. So, so it's 3x what it used to be. Exactly. So that's because we live in a culture of scrolling on your phones and Instagram messages popping up here and there. And that's mention the bombardment of emails. So really differentiating yourself really means having that consistent message and making sure that you're talking about it in the same manner over and over again. Um, And that's consistent for branding too. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a reason that Coca-Cola has changed their logo very little over the last, you Mm -hmm. know, hundred years. It's, you know, they might change a font here and there, but they're still red and white. Same with Pepsi still is red, white, and blue. They, you know, they just change it slightly. You don't reinvent the wheel unless there's a reason for doing doing it. Usually that is a legal reason that you need to do it <laughs> for one reason or another, but um, you just mm-hmm. stay consistent and that's how people remember your branding. But you mentioned something earlier though, marketing is always changing. So you're, mm-hmm. you're kind of throwing me a curveball here with this <laughs> consistency and always changing thing. So right. explain that. Cause I, again, I talk to a lot of marketing people and you know, they want to be, they want to get those creative juices going and come up with a crazy TikTok or whatever. And what you're saying is 
We'll hold the horses on that. Well, actually, I, I feel like I'm saying the same thing. And what I mean by that is you can be consistent and have the same logo out there. You can have the same branding out there. You can talk about it in the same talk track, but you can do it in different ways. So the emails that used to land that were just text, maybe those aren't landing for you. So maybe you need to try it with a graphic up front or a different tagline on it. If TikTok videos where you used to just show somebody, you know, doing flipping a bottle and that could like advertise your company because your logo was on the bottle. If that's not working anymore, maybe you do a cooking video that can bring that in there. Maybe you have, you know, a different location that you're going to that really grabs their attention. But the messaging at the core is still the same. I'm here for you. I've got great customer service or we've got this great feature set or whatever that message is should always be the same and be consistent. Otherwise, people aren't going to remember you. Right. Because I think one of the things that small businesses in particular, right? Let me an entrepreneur start up a small shop as opposed to like a more of a corporate environment. You know, they they don't really know what their brand is. I mean, they think their logo is their brand. But they don't really know what the community thinks about them and how the community views them. What right. would be some some things someone could do to kind of get a grasp on that? Um, so that's actually a great question. I think that actually really dips over into persona-based marketing. Right. So what that specifically is, is you need to, first of all, when you're starting out, it's kind of like throwing spaghetti at a wall. You try a lot of different things and see what sticks. Right. And once you kind of are out there and talking to people in the Starbucks line and you know writing those emails and seeing what's working and what's not, you can take that data and start to kind of really learn from that and mm-hmm. do some self-reflection and business reflection as far as, hey, this is really working for me. I need to kind of you know, pull that thread a little bit more. And this is what's not working for me. Right. You can also start to see those personas. Like I'm really getting through to more of the creative types, to the sales and marketing people. And I'm not getting through to the IT people. And why is that? Do I need to change my messaging? Do I need to change the platform that maybe the creative people are more interactive on Instagram instead Mm. of like a TikTok, or maybe their IT are more responding to emails than they are on LinkedIn. I mean, you really just need to understand not only the messaging for who the persona is, but you also need to understand the platform and you need to meet meet them where they are because mm-hmm. not everybody's the same. And, and quite frankly, when you're advertising or marketing yourself, put yourself in their shoes. So people are selfish by nature and they're sure. looking at things like, what's in it for me? Right. Is there a sale that's coming for me? Are they going to accommodate me? Do they have a fast turnaround for me? Like, what is that that you can talk to them about? It's not just about, wow, I have these, you know, the latest tech. It's really like, what are those feature sets that's in it for, for the other person? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Photo retailers, energize your sales with Share Me Chat the proven texting platform. Using chat to text on your website keeps your customers connected and buying. See us at Pro and IPI to find out why dealers using ShareMe Chat close more sales without adding staff. Find out more at shareme.chat. Because I think, you know, a lot of people, especially in, in our industry, the the photo industry, you know, there's a lot of very established businesses, right? You got a camera store that's been in a community for 40 years and maybe it's passed yeah. on to the kids or you got a what used to be a one hour photo lab, which is now a fully blown like digital printing center with. And sometimes when I when I talk to those folks, they'll say, you know, people kind of pigeonhole us in that old view, but I'm doing all this other stuff. You know, and that's where they kind of have to, you know, figure out how to add on to that message to let people know that, hey, you know, I'm I'm doing, you know, I can make photo T-shirts now. I can do mugs. I can do all these other things. I'm not just, you know, prints and whatnot. Not that those aren't wonderful products, which we all adore. But, you know, it's sort of so that's where I think, you know, people struggle with, you know, it's the 20 rule, right? Most people are your profits and everything come from the 80% of the business. So they right. will focus on that, but they want to grow that 20% without losing sight of what brought you to the, to the dance. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's a tricky line to walk on because yeah. 
if you stay with that 80% and you never grow or never innovate, then you're at a risk of becoming irrelevant at some point. Right. So you really do want to nurture those other expanding parts of your business, but you need to be realistic. You can't dump all of your eggs into that 20% basket. You need to have that balance there. So um, catering still to that 80%, but making sure that you're talking about that 20% or things that are coming up, um, there's, there's mm-hmm. definitely a way to do that. You just again, need to be consistent in your messaging and say, hey, we have all these things. Hey, we can be customizable to you. Hey, we can do things that other places can't do because we can scale with you. If you have a giant job or a small job, and we can um, really be there for you. And I think that resonates with a lot of people because especially since things move so fastly in today, you know, so quickly in today's world, you you see people who really see the benefit of having that time savings for, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that need for expansion. Because I think one of the things with, uh, you know, particularly most small businesses now is unlike, you know, maybe 10 years ago, a lot of them, because of technology, can actually compete at a higher level with bigger people, right? You know, you're, for yes. example, a coffee shop, right? They can offer many of the same types of coffee than a national chain can, right? Right. And very competitively. And, uh, you know, they can do the pumpkin spice latte or whatever, you know, whatever the yeah. trendy thing is. Right? right. So and in the imaging business, it's the same way. So you've got this the, this tension of having to, you know, match the big guys, but also differentiate yourself. Can you talk a little bit about differentiation against like entrenched players? Yeah, actually, I think that's a huge thing to, to pull on, which is that. So what's in it for me, that kind of adage when you're talking about yourself and when you're kind of marketing yourself Mm -hmm. is really important to look at what those differences are that stands, that makes you stand out. Are you a faster turnaround? Maybe do Mm -hmm. you, um, are you right next door? So if there's a problem, you have better customer service than them. That's a huge one that people are losing in today's fast paced world. Um, you know, whatever those pieces are really kind of even just sitting down and drawing a diagram, like the pros and the cons for your business, have a healthy eye on it. Ask your neighbor to look at it, have some fresh set of eyes, look at it and look at those differentiators and say, does this make sense to you? Would this make, would you just make you pay attention to what my offerings are? Then get somebody else's opinion on it. You don't need Mm -hmm. to go out and hire a consultant for that. You can just have somebody, you know, Mm -hmm. who's not in the trenches with you and in the weeds and to take a, take a fresh look at it and, and really, focusing on those things that make you different and unique can can do wonders for that 20% of your business because if they're like oh wow they're not only are they tried and true with my 80% of business and I'll always go to them for this but maybe I'll try them on this other piece because that is something different I didn't know mm-hmm. I could do that all in one shop and they can turn it around in a week or whatever it is mm-hmm. um, and and sometimes that's that's all you need to get that little bit of leg up and, and get those customer loyalty so how often do you think a typical small business owners should be looking at this? Is this monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, yearly, whenever I'm panicking because my sales are dropping? (laughs) Um, So I think uh, obviously it depends on the company, Um, but really having this uh, as a quarterly reflection, I think is uh, very fair and doable. It doesn't mean you have to do a deep dive, probably annually you do a bigger deep dive, Mm -hmm. but every quarter you kind of look at it and say, okay, how are things going along? How am I doing with this? What happened with this campaign? What happened with my, you know, my LinkedIn posts? What are the analytics on that? Did I, did I do a good job with this? And then you can kind of tweak them up and down as you need to. But um, quarterly, I think is doable for most people. If you are entrenched in a tech company, then you're doing it way more often than that and and kind of taking a peek at it. Um, But quarterly, I think, is pretty fair for a small business to look at. And what are some of the metrics somebody would look at? For example, you said measuring things. I mean, you know, there's a wide variety of metrics for different things when you're judging marketing, right? I mean, if you do a direct mailer, you know, if you're a if you're a snow removal business, for example, and you send out a direct mail and you get a two percent return, that's awesome. Yeah, great. right. It's a great I mean, return. You're, yeah. you're doing great. <laughs> right. If you're doing a uh, social media campaign, that's not so great. What are some of the basic you know rules of thumb? I think would be would be decent metrics, and let's just pick things you know very obvious things that I think our audience would be using would be things like you know social YouTube. Uh, they are doing some TikTok and short videos and that kind of thing. Yeah. So um, obviously everybody 
talks about sales. So what are your sales doing in relation to what you're putting out? Um, and so that's, of course, one metric that's always at the backbone of the things that you look at. Um, but I would argue that it's not just your sales or your lead gen. Right. It's also going to be your your brand awareness. So how much are you out there? How much are you getting those, those views or clicks or that type of traffic that's going to your website sure. or to form fills? Um, and then you, to measure those, there's a lot of tools that you pay for. So if you have a CRM that you're keeping track of your customers, Customers, like, and what's um, a CRM for the for the people who don't know? Um, well, it's a tool. It's a customer relationship tool that you can okay. keep track of, you know, who those customers are. So, mm-hmm. you know, Bob Jones came in and they bought, you know, mm-hmm. four T-shirts for me. And mm-hmm. here's their address. And I've noticed that they come in every five months and order three T-shirts for me. So it helps you keep track of them, not right. only their contact information, but a cadence with them. It's mm-hmm. a great place. And a lot of times so it's, what's interesting is I didn't mean to interrupt, but just real quick yeah. is because I think that's valuable because some people don't look at their customer traffic that closely. They just look at sales, they don't look at who's doing it. This is often built into into your POS system even. Right, right, exactly. Nowadays, especially, um, you know, if you use something like Square or, or any of those POS systems, um, nowadays you can keep good track of that or even have them tie into if you have, a, you know, a HubSpot or Salesforce or another CRM system. Mm-hmm. Um, but just kind of keeping track of those and seeing that will help you with the persona base also, because if you start keeping track of your customers, that Bob Jones who came in and, you know, bought those t-shirts every five months, you can start keeping track. Well, hey, I noticed that Bob Jones is in, you know, the trucking industry. So maybe if I'm having success with him, maybe that's a target audience that I should start right. looking at. And so you could tailor some of your ads or um, or your outreach into that industry. So that could help you with um, that front of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also free tools if somebody's not using a CRM. There's, you know, Google analytics that you can put um, on your website or even tie into your POS. And those can help you to kind of look at your traffic and see, hey, there was a spike on these dates or I seem to have spikes on the weekends, but not during the week. And why is that? Mm -hmm. And you can start taking that data and kind of figuring out if I'm getting more traffic on the weekends than during the week, then maybe that means that I should be scheduling my posts to go out more on the weekends than during the week because that's right. when more people are going to see it. So you can start adjusting what you're doing based on what that da- data is. So um, there's no such thing as too much data, uh, just the reverse. <laughs> well, well, there is if you don't know how to, if you don't, if you can't interpret it, right? Of course, and, of course. <laughs> and you know, in, in the photography industry, the, uh, you know, it's very much feast or famine, right? Because the fourth oh, yeah. quarter is crazy because of all the gifting and all that kind of right. stuff that happens you know people buy cameras for gifts and all that other stuff and then the rest of the rest of the year they're trying to fill in the gaps run holidays and you know those right. kind of fun things is there such a thing as too much data um so i would argue no but i'm gonna tell you why um <laughs> I, i'm gonna tell you no because uh personally p360 actually has a product that deals with data management. Um, So I think if you have data and you're not processing it properly or you don't know what to do with it, then you end up with something that they they call siloed data. So you have, you know, say you're getting your t-shirt sales here, you're getting your traffic here, and they're not talking to each other. And then that is considered too much data because it's useless. You're not doing anything with it. It doesn't mean anything. Um, But there's so many tools nowadays that you can take that data and actually make it make sense. You can say, you can correlate a sale from somebody who was on your website and you can figure out how long we, they were there or mm-hmm. they came from a LinkedIn ad that you posted and you can start connecting those dots um, behind the scenes and really get some insights about mm-hmm. where your marketing's working and where your brand awareness is landing not only those personas but also where your efforts are making sense and then you can you know kind of pull that thread a little bit more and put some more effort into that that bucket okay because that's one of the things I think where you know, because people are awash in data, right? I mean, I'm thinking of the person who's, you know, they're coming into their, their, you know, uh, photo lab and it's, they've got six employees and the the one of them didn't show up today. Yeah. And, you know, and the other one called in sick and, and the printer's out of paper and this vendor's doing, so, I mean, you're putting out fires a lot during the day. Right. Um, right. So, you know, I could see where someone would, uh, have to have a challenge with this. Are there a lot, and when you said about, when you talk about tools, are, are there reasonable tools or someone could just like lump this into a dashboard to, to look at this kind of stuff, to at least get an idea of what they should be looking at? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, there's a lot of tools out there. And if somebody's just starting out a small business, um, Google has free access and tools for you to use to mm -hmm. take that data and to put it into a dashboard. So, I mean, the first things you do is even just Google Analytics helps you to kind of figure out mm -hmm. traffic and flow. Um, and and thankfully, there's a lot of free sources online um, that you can learn how to use it and learn how to digest that data. Mm -hmm. um, if you are growing your business and you're getting to be larger and you need something more, there's a lot of tools out there to evaluate, um, mm -hmm. you know, what you need to do and make it talk to each other. Mm -hmm. um, the, the biggest, the largest thing about data that you need to remember is that bad data goes in and bad data comes out or good data goes in and good data comes out. So when you're looking for a data solution, you really want to make sure that there's something in there that's going to help clean that data, going to make sure that it's up to date, make sure that there's, you know, get rid of duplicates. There's some sort of cleaning mechanism inside your data programs that, um, you know, what you're, what you're using is, mm -hmm. is valuable. So like in the same, the example I made that Bob Jones, who's buying t-shirts, if you have the wrong email address to him and his email keeps bouncing every time that you're trying to send him, you know, a sale that you're having on t-shirts, then it's kind of useless, right? That's bad, mm -hmm. bad data. So you want to know that the next time he places an order, you want to say, hey, Bob, thank you so much for your order. I just want to confirm the email address we have on file here. So you can clean that up and you can make sure that it um, that it makes sense and can be useful in the future. Mm -hmm. in, a, in a typical organization, who should have access to that? Should it just be the owner or who should, who should be looking at the data? Ooh, so that's a trick question. Um, so, uh, you know, there's there's a, always a fear of there's too many chefs in the kitchen, right? So um, say you have exactly. an organization of 20 people, you don't want all 20 people going in there and changing things and messing up somebody else. Um, that's right. the fear. So thankfully, with a lot of these tools, um, and actually every single one that I know about with data, um, not just from P360, but even Google, you can have different... Um, permissions mm -hmm. so that the owners or a CEO or somebody who's running it or somebody who's head of data, um, mm -hmm. they can have the highest access and they can change anything they want. Um, and then maybe there's other people that are users that can just input. They can say, hey, Sally Jones came in and bought you know, a t-shirt today and they can input that data but they can't delete anything out. So hopefully they can only do minimal damage <laughs> as far as anything that's in there. At least maybe they're um, hopefully, because... hopefully they're inputting it correctly, right? Correct, correct. So you kind of want that a little bit of hierarchy so that not all 20 people in this example are trying to do something in a different manner. Um, but also along with that is when you do implement some, something to do with your data or even a CRM, um, if you're using data for just that facet, you want to make sure that there's some sort of internal you know, um, good best practices like, hey, when I get a new customer and, you know, Susie Q is coming in to buy a t-shirt, this is my normal thing that I do. I do an intake form or something and I'm going to get her basic information and I'm going to put it into this specific place in the CRM. Mm -hmm. And as long as everybody else in the company knows what that best practices mm -hmm. is, then mm -hmm. usually things flow by pretty smoothly. Um, it's just when you start getting a little bit more complicated in, in mm -hmm. marketing automations, it can get a little bit, um, a little hairy in there if you have too many chefs in the kitchen. Yeah, and you don't want to do like a sit down interview with every customer, right? Give of me your course. home address, your mother's maiden name. And other, I mean, you Fourth can get by, card, I, I, yeah. I'm thinking of like a POS type environment, right? right? Where if you can come in, someone's transacting over the counter, they bought, you know, a photo mug or something and say, hey, can you sign, can we sign you up for our newsletter? Boom, and exactly. you put in the input in the newsletter, and you make sure you got their phone because hey, we want to call you next time your order is ready. We want to make sure your phone number is correct. So these are all right. natural ways to yes. get the data without conducting a full blown marketing thing. Because again, you don't need to know everything. Right, right, exactly. And then uh, another good thing to note too is that um, you know when people want to hear from you varies based on the person and that it's not just a, a persona um, based marketing. This is just people in life because their life gets busy. So you always want to give them an opportunity to opt out of any of those emails sure, if they're yeah. getting them too often. So you want to make sure that you're respecting those boundaries. Um, we don't quite have as strict rules here in the U.S. as they do in Europe with GDPR, but they have a lot of very strict or opt in opt out rules. But um, we, we still have them here, too, if you're doing the steady yeah. marketing in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's that's one of the things. I mean, you, you definitely want to maintain contact, but you know, right. you and I have all been on, you know, lists where, oh goodness, do I need to hear from them three times a week? Yeah, or more, or sometimes you know you hear from every day, and you're like, I don't need tips about my gutter cleaning every single day. Like I don't, <laughs> it's just too much. So I'm gonna opt exactly. out of that one right now. Right. <laughs> exactly. But I think there is sort of a belief that you know, hey, does it cost me anything? You right. know, send them on an email, you know, whatever. And it's just like, well, no, you want to be effective. Exactly. Exactly. That.
And I think that's the trick too, is kind of figuring out what, um, what is getting your message out there and what is being effective without bombarding them. Because, right. um, you know, even though this 21 number sounds giant for a touch point, but it doesn't mean that you send them 21 emails. That right. means that you're showing up on their their social media. That means maybe there's an advertisement that goes to their house. I mean, there's there's all different ways to actually right. have those, there, those touch points there. Yeah, I mean, they may see your, you know, if you've got a, a banner outside your, your store, right. you drive past it. That's a touch point too, right? Right, exactly. So, yeah, so there's all kinds of ways to, to skin that cat. Now, the other thing that's a challenge is in consumer marketing, you've got different markets, right? So for example, in photography, you know, there's a lot of people who are, you know, traditional, you know, boomer types, if you will. And then there's the millennials who have the kids and they want stuff. And then you got the whole Gen Z thing happening now where they're shooting film yeah and processing film they're like the big film users are these you know the gen z's and early and late millennials right you know you can't talk the same way to all these people you so can't. that's a challenge too yeah well yeah and i think that's uh, kind of goes back to just knowing your audience and kind of figuring out how you're going to market to them right. so um you know there's been a countless studies that have really been uh, that have come out about buying habits and spending trends. Um, and specifically when you talk about the boomer generation, they um, are very big on loyalty. So they are very huge on, I know you, I know this company ABC and I love that company ABC and they've always been good to me and they are going to be loyal. Even when there's a hiccup, even if their prices spike slightly, they're going to be very loyal to a specific brand that they know and trust. So that is that market. So that's really that consistency, you know me, that type of language in there. A millennial is a little bit different. They are more influenced on influencer marketing so somebody told them or they see those ads on social media and they're going to be influenced on those so that's a little bit slightly different that's not really trustworthy to a specific person they know it could be somebody more in an ad based um, and gen z those are they're they're actually pretty um, cost conscious when it comes down to it so they are starting to be more and more effective as if there's a sale on something and somebody told them that hey there's a promotion that they can get or it's a buy one get one free or there's a five percent discount if they right. give somebody a referral so you're starting to see these little shifts in marketing that if you're paying attention to who your audience base is you can start catering your um your talk okay. to them. well that, that's interesting so you know because i've heard different things with different people mm -hmm. where again they're you know, let's say they've inherited their parents' camera store and they're running it right. and they're maybe, you know, late millennial or, or, or boomer or something like that. And they delegate kind of some of the social stuff mm -hmm. to the younger members of the staff, right? Right. But you still have to provide a framework for right. that person. Like, like going back to our original discussion point, consistency. Right, right. Right. So do you have any advice for people to who are in that situation for to try and keep the uh, the the youth of today on on track when it comes to the marketing message? Because I think, you know, they may see something on uh, a TikTok or, you know, video uh, YouTube short or something and they want to do it like that. But they may not that may not be consistent with the brand. Yeah. So an exercise that I do for every company that I have worked for um, is to create uh, brand guidelines. So what this is, is it doesn't have to be overly complicated. It can be, you know, for our P360, it's we always use that purple. Um, this right. is the way that it, that it looks. This is how you put the P in front of the. It's simple like that. Um, the font that you can use um, inside mm -hmm. documents, that are official documents. Um, so things like that, I think, are important. But I think there nowadays a, also like language and appearance are important too. Agreed. Agreed. So part of that that concept of having a brand that you follow and having that those brand guidelines is there's also a description in there. So mm -hmm. that description of what P360 is or what our products are, those we revisit those every so often. Right. And so if you talk to the people in your company, in this example, let's say it's the 20 person company we mentioned earlier. If you talk to every person and ask them, hey, describe our company. What what does it mean to you? I'm in line at Starbucks and somebody asks you what that is. What 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 would you say? You collect that data and you say, okay, everybody said these three bullet points, but this one is way off. We need to stop saying that. Right. <laughs> and then you can create this kind of basically an internal cheat sheet to right. give to your employees. I think that that's really valuable because then everybody would hopefully be saying very similar things when you're talking right. to them and having that consistent message, which is what, what you want.
Yeah, you know, I can I can see that. I can also see where you might get some pushback from folks yeah. who are like, you know, you know, maybe they're not a fit for your company or to be talking about your company in public, right? If if they're not willing to go by that, because that's really part of the job. But with 100%. specifically some younger folks who are influenced by influencers, right? They're mm -hmm. used to that sort of authenticity where maybe dropping an F-bomb is cool and edgy and commonplace, but not appropriate for Bob's camera. <laughs> Right, exactly. And actually part of that exercise to kind of learn what your brand identity is and how you talk about your brand, you need to make a decision about how you're going to handle your marketing. So for us personally, we um, we only talk positively. Like if we have a direct competitor and we, we're we not going to say, oh, they're they're not good and we're great. We're going to say we're Even great. Even though that because. may be the case. It might, it might be the case, but we're not going to say that from a marketing standpoint because it's not who we are as an identity. So right. Bob's Camera Shop uh, would have to understand who they are. And maybe they're they're in a position where they can have those kind of cheeky, you know, maybe they're a little bit more edgy in the way that they do their marketing. That is a decision that should be made behind the scenes. And then you can present that to the world in your social and your outreach and your emails if you, right. um, to, if you take that edge. But it's really a tone and tenor question about how you're going to brand yourself. Right. So, cause it's, cause you want to have that consistency, right? Cause that's where I, you know, I've heard a couple of cases where, you know, people are at a conference and we're saying, oh, we did, we had a TikTok and it was great. So we got a ton of views and it was great. And so somebody goes back home and says, well, I'm going to do some TikToks then. And they let, right. you know, the person behind the counter do some TikToks, but it may not be brand appropriate. Right, right, exactly. So, you know, that kind of circles back to the same thing we're talking about, which is, you know, you really need to understand who your audience is and who that persona is. So if if maybe that TikTok that you're talking about, maybe that really is there, they can sink in with the, what their brand identity is, but it, it, it um, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're going to do that, plan to do that, I guess. <laughs> right, right. And have some transparency inside your company so that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, whoever owns the company really should be making those decisions about, okay, let's move a little more edgy or let's be a little more conservative or just kind of understanding what that market is right. and, and being respectful of that, I think is important. Because planning and marketing is key. Well, listen, Kate, it's been great talking to you. Uh, where can people go for more information on you and P360? Sure. I mean, you can find us on all social media, especially LinkedIn. Um, our website's www.p360.com. Nice and easy. Well, that sounds great. Listen, Kate, it was great to meet you. I appreciate the advice. I love the consistency message. That was awesome. And you have a great week. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Gary, for having me.